So what are the objections? Supposedly, the Bible says Jesus is the first creature of the Father. Revelation 3.14, Proverbs 8.22, and Colossians 1.15. So let's go through these texts. Let's start with Proverbs 8, shall we? Let's start with Proverbs 8, shall we? And if you go to my blog, I have been taking excerpts from the book, putting or the incarnate Christ and his critics, so that you can at least read some of the material online for free. But you're going to have to get the book. Here it is. So here's what they wrote about Proverbs 8.22. It's right here. So all here. But let's go through Proverbs 8.22. Does Proverbs 8.22 teach that Christ as wisdom is created? This is Stafford's go-to text. It's one of his favorite texts along with Colossians 1.15. So, so let's go through it, shall we? Let's go through it. Here's how it reads in Revised Standard Version. Now, Staffy has an advantage. If you are Orthodox or Catholic or Syrian Church of the East, you're stuck with Proverbs 8. Protestants who go with Sola Scriptura, Tota Scriptura, are not obligated to take this interpretation because they'll ignore the church fathers and the church writers and theologians. Now, let me repeat. If you are Orthodox or Catholic or Syrian church, whether Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, and you treasure the fathers and their early Christian writers and believe they were guided by the Spirit, then Proverbs 8 was one of their favorite proof texts to show the divine begetting of the Son. Why do I say that? Athanasius, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Hippolytus, all appeal to Proverbs 8.22 as speaking of the pre-human Christ. Christ in his pre-human existence being the wisdom of God because the New Testament calls Christ the wisdom of God. And the language of wisdom is applied to Christ. So he's the word of God, Logos, right? In Hebrew, Davar. Right, the Sophia of God, wisdom of God, because in Greek the word wisdom is Sophia, and in Hebrew it would be Chokma, or someone would say Chokma, right? And they believe Proverbs 8 is Christ in his preeminent existence because Proverbs 8 it's wisdom talking. So if you are Orthodox, if you are Catholic, if you are a Syrian church, you are stuck with this, and Greg Stafford and Joe's witnesses know this. Because the fathers, church writers, not everyone was a father. Origen wasn't a father. Tertullian wasn't a father, right? They all believe this passage referred to Christ. But here's your problem. Here's how it reads in the Revised Standard Version. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Did you know who used this passage? Did you know who loved this passage? Did you know who employed this passage against Athanasius? Arius. Arius and his followers, or those who believe like Arius, believed that this taught that the Son was the first of the Father's creations. And you see why, right? You see why? So you're going to have to learn what this passage means and doesn't mean and master it if you don't want to simply ignore the fathers and simply treat this as personification. And I'll explain that all because we're going to probably do entire session as Proverbs 8. If you don't mind, we're going to learn a lot in these series. Arius loved this passage. Arius used this passage. Forcing Athanasius to come up with an explanation that contextually is problematic. Are you with me there? Did you know how Athanasius interpreted Proverbs 8.22? He said that this is referring to the time when the wisdom would become man. So when wisdom says God created me, it means he created me to be a man. 
That's not the obvious meaning. That's not the meaning contextually. Are you guys, you want me to go deep on this? Remember, no Orthodox, no Catholic, no Assyrian Church of the East believes any one father is completely right all the time or infallible. That's not the teaching of the Orthodox or Catholic or Assyrian Church. Athanasius, when he responds to Arius' use of this text, says, well, the reason why wisdom says she was created is because wisdom is anticipating her incarnation. Wisdom will become man, and as a man, in that regard, she was created. That's not the meaning. He did his best, but he's not infallible, nor do you take his opinion, everything he stated. That's just the fact. I'm not stating something new for you Orthodox and Catholics or Assyrian Church of these. No one believes that one particular writer or father is completely right all the time. Are you with me there? Why did he do that? Because in the Greek, it posed a problem. Here's the English translation of the Greek. Because remember, Arius is speaking Greek. Athanasius speaking Greek. They're reading the Greek version of the Old Testament. Now watch how it reads in the Greek. Who's heretic? I know you are, dude. Arius was your ancestor. Right here. Watch here. Let's go here. And I'm going to show you its wisdom. The Lord made me the beginning of his ways for his works. Now, you guys who know Greek, here's the verb, ektis, me. Ektisimi comes from the word, comes from the word ktizo, and it's the word create. And this is what Arius hammered on. Ektisimi, ektisi, ktizo, create. He hammered on this. See, wisdom is created. See that, guys? You see why Arius loved this passage? Do you see nothing new under the sun? The same heresies being repackaged by Satan? See it? So what do we do with this? This is why Joe's Witnesses quote this. Ectisimi, from ktikzo, the verb, the noun, right? Meaning create. You with me there? So what do we do with this? Does that mean we're stumped? No, doesn't mean we're stumped. Number one, before seeing Christ in this passage, the first question you need to ask yourself is, in its historical cultural context, in its historical cultural context, what is this referring to in its historical cultural context? In other words, if I didn't have the New Testament and I was just reading this at the time of Solomon and I wanted to know what this is all about, in its context, it's the personification of wisdom. Okay, what do I mean? All right, what is personification? Well, let me go back to that excerpt from the best book written on the deity of Christ, bar none. Personification, right here. Right here. And uh, this is an excerpt from this book. The Incarnate Christ and His Critics. Personification is another figure of speech. We use this when we speak of something inanimate as if it were alive. Okay? Learn grammar. Learn literary genre. Learn metaphors and similes and symbols and how language works. This is true of all languages. Personification is another figure of speech. We use this when speaking of something inanimate as if it were alive. For example, the Bible tells us death ruled as king from Adam down to Moses. See, death is being personified as if it's a person, as a ruler. Grief and sighing must flee away. So grief and sighing are described as people as individuals that need to get lost. Truism itself keeps crying aloud in the very street. 
death grief sighing and wisdom cannot really rule flee or cry out but speaking as if they did the bible paints vivid mental pictures easily visualized and remembered you see what a personification is and by the way you know where where they're quoting from where did they get this quote from watchtower magazine june 1st 1984 also inside this is the Jehovah Witness statements. You understand? That's a personification. Let's go here where it's personification. Right here, see? This statement is exactly right. So you understand what a personification is? Let's go deeper. Let's go into the text. You guys get it? Even the Jehovah's Witnesses recognize and know what personification happens to be. A personification is to take something that's not personal, not animate, not conscious, and describing it as if it were a person. So I can speak of the cup as my friend. In fact, you see personification all over my house. You remember? Here, the door. Remember what I called the door? Butch. Exactly, Fessin. This is Butch. My buddy Butch. Many a Butch. He speaks. Jilu. Here. That's personification. Here. How about Timmy? Here's Timmy. Timmy right here. See? Timmy. That's personification. Okay, personification. What you find in the book of Proverbs is Solomon personifying the attributes of God, personification. So let's go into the text. Let's go into the text now. The heat is all. Solomon is describing God's wisdom attribute as a living, conscious being. And he describes wisdom as a woman. Why? Okay. Does not wisdom call? See, the chapter is about wisdom. And discernment give forth her voice. You see it? Her voice. At the top of the heights upon the way, where the pathways meet, she takes her stand. Besides the gates at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she makes a shout. Now, why is wisdom described as a woman? The reason why wisdom speaks as a woman is because the Hebrew noun for wisdom, hokma, is a feminine noun. Let me show it to you. Hokma, go here, noun, feminine, singular. It's a feminine noun. Yeah, I'm going to show you that. Wickedness is said to be a woman. Yeah, I'm not lying. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Okay, but why is wickedness said to be a woman? Okay, now do you guys click here? Hokma, noun, feminine singular. It's a feminine noun in Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic. Nouns have gender. Nouns have gender. Okay, but it doesn't mean. That the noun that has gender, it doesn't mean it is male or female. That's not how it works. You, you, you with me there? That's all, folks. That's just how language is. That's why in all languages, even Greek, but Greek has a neuter noun, meaning a noun that's neither male nor female or masculine nor feminine in gender. Okay. You guys who speak more, more than one language will know. In Spanish, the word for car can be a feminine noun or a masculine noun. Now, in Greek, the word wisdom is also feminine. It's Sophia. That's a feminine noun. Dunamis, power. That's a feminine noun. That doesn't mean power is a woman. 1 Corinthians one twenty four. What's the word for wisdom in Greek? Sophian from Sophia, 
noun, accusative, feminine, singular. And Jesus' name is Sophia in Greek. Look, Christ, the power of God, do not mean ke theou, Sophia. One of Jesus' names in the Greek New Testament is Sophia. But he's not a woman. Right? Okay, so do you see why wisdom speaks as a woman? Because the noun in Hebrew is feminine. So now the writer wants to personify wisdom, wants to describe wisdom as a being. Now, if wisdom is a feminine noun in both Hebrew and Greek, and he wants to now personify wisdom, describe wisdom as a person, what gender? Would wisdom be described in? So we got it now? And that's what Solomon does. So Sophia in Greek, Hokmah in Hebrew, feminine. So now he's going to personify wisdom. So he has wisdom speaking as a woman, her voice, right? She cries aloud. All right. Now, before I go on, let me show you that. Wickedness is a woman. So you ladies who got excited, yeah, say women are wives. Yeah, but you're also stinking wicked. What What do you mean? Here you go. Watch here. Zechariah 5, 5 to 11. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth, what this is going forth. So I said, what is it? I said, this is the ephah going forth. And again, he said, this is the air appearance in all the land. And behold, the lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Then he said, this is wickedness. There a woman inside the ephah. This is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and threw the lead weight on its opening. But let's keep reading. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, two women. Were coming out with wind in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. Did you catch it? Here you have spirit creatures with wings, and they're women. But notice their wings are like a stork. Guess what? If you read Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, one of the unclean birds that you can't eat is a stork. So these spirit creatures who are women, they're unclean spirit creatures. Ha! And I said to an angel speaking with me, where are they taking the ifa? They said to me to build a house for her in the land of Shinar. Shinar is the biblical term for Babylon in Iraq. See, now, honestly, do you wonder why wickedness appears as a woman? Let me show you again why. Wickedness is being personified. Why as a woman? Now, let me show you. Before you women say, that's it. I'm going to become a Buddhist. The Bible is too misogynistic. I thought Islam was bad. Hold on. Let me, hold on. Let's see what the word wickedness is in Hebrew. It is a feminine noun. Harisha. Risha. It's a feminine noun. That's why, ladies. Tekerise. Tekerise. Tekerise, ladies. Ladies, Tekerisi, it's personification. Glory to Lord God. Yep, it is. The whore of Babylon. Yep, good connection there. But you keep thinking about the whore of Babylon. Who upset you that you keep thinking of whores, dude? Tekerisi, Maraga. That's why it's a personification, folks. The reason why wickedness appears as a woman is because the noun for wickedness, Risha, is a feminine noun. So if it's a feminine noun, you're going to personify wickedness as a woman, not as this Kenny Rogers lookalike Protestant believer. Because if the noun was masculine, then the text would say that David Wood was taken to Shinar. Because you don't get more wicked and ugly than David Wood. Wickedness would be personified as David would. Do you get it now? Are you seeing? 
personification, how it works. If you don't know languages, if you don't know that in Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, other languages, nouns will have gender associated with them, masculine noun, feminine noun, you won't get it. Why? Here, a woman is said to be wickedness. Wickedness appears as a woman. But elsewhere, wisdom appears as a woman. That's personification. Do we get the point? I hope I'm not boring you with this level of in detail. Really, I hope not. I hope you really are learning because this is how you exegete. This is how you exegete. This is what you would do if you're doing exegesis. Look at the historical, cultural background, the grammar, syntax. This is exegesis. And as the Spirit teaches me, may He teach you through me. Right? We got it now? No way. Strange? Not as strange as your mother. Ida. Ask the Shia. Arisha. All right. Anyway. Now let's go to Proverbs 8 and see what the point of Proverbs 8 is. So wisdom cries out. What is she saying? To you, O men, I call. And my voice is to the sons of men. We'll have to do a two-part in Proverbs 8 to unpack everything. O simple ones, understand prudence. And O fools, understand the heart of wisdom. Listen, for I will speak noble things. And the opening of my lips will reveal upright things. For my mouth will utter truth. And wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There's nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straightforward to him who understands. And right to those who find knowledge. Take my discipline and not silver. And knowledge rather than the choicest fine gold. For wisdom is better than pearls. And all desirable things cannot compare with her. Do you understand? The personification. Solomon is personifying wisdom in order to teach you, do nothing without God's wisdom. Let me explain the purpose of Proverbs. Proverbs is an inspired book instructing you on the wisdom of God. God has given you his wisdom so you can know his wisdom and apply it so you can live a life successful and pleasing to God, and avoid snares and pitfalls. And so now Solomon is having wisdom call you. Look, come to me. You want to be happy before God? You want God to be pleased with you? You want to live a successful life? You don't want to destroy yourself or your family? Put me into practice. Obey me. Love me. Cherish me. Do all I tell you. That's the point. This is why Proverbs, if you read it, it even tells you mundane things about co-signing. Did you know there is a section in Proverbs telling you who to co-sign for and who do not co-sign for? Do you know that? It covers every base. And even tells you the qualities of a man and a woman to look for. Now let's go to Proverbs 8. Now you understand what personification is? So wisdom is speaking personification so if you ask me sam in the context and the backdrop of proverbs 8 is proverbs 8 talking about a divine being <clears throat> no it's historical cultural right historical cultural back background it's talking about god's wisdom his attribute of wisdom right and wisdom is speaking as a woman because the noun is a feminine noun. And why is Solomon personifying wisdom? To show you, you need God's wisdom to live a successful life. <clears throat> so let's go. Take my discipline, not silver, and knowledge rather than choices, fine gold. For wisdom is better than pearls, and all desirable things cannot compare with her. Now, to show you how stupid Stafford is, if you take this as a divine being, well, then that means there must be more than one divine being because it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. So now you have another divine being called prudence. You get it? Now I'm going to show you 
why the fathers were not mistaken in seeing this as a picture of Christ. But in of itself, this chapter is not Christ speaking. And I find knowledge and discretion. <clears throat> the fear of Yahweh is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way. See, what? look what wisdom is telling you. Avoid these things. And the mouth of the perverted words, I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. Now, because Stafford is a special kind of stupid. He goes, you see, wisdom says she owns wisdom. And therefore, this wisdom must be a person and not God's attribute. Notice how stupid this guy is. He's a special kind of stupid. He says, you see, wisdom says, I, wisdom, possess counsel and sound wisdom. Well, if wisdom is God's attribute, why would the attribute say, I possess the attribute of wisdom? That means this wisdom must be a person. That only shows you how stupid the guy is. In personification, if I'm going to personify wisdom, then in that personification, you can have her speaking in such a way as claiming to possess sound wisdom. That's the whole point of personification. But now watch. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Might is mine. By me, kings reign. You need wisdom to be a <clears throat> wise king. And rulers mark out righteousness. By me, princes rule. And nobles, all who judge rightly. I love those who love me. And those who earnestly seek me will find me. Riches and glory are with me. Enduring wealth and righteousness. <clears throat> My fruit is better than fine gold. Even pure gold. Because you can't take gold and silver with you to the day of judgment. And my produce, <clears throat> better than choice silver. I walk in the path of righteousness, in the midst of the pathways of justice, to give those who love me an inheritance of all, that I may fill their treasuries. Now <clears throat> begins verse 22. Now begins verse 22, right? Okay, Legacy Standard Bible. Let's first read it, understand it, and then we're going to unpack it. Yahweh possessed me. Qanani, Qana. The debate is on the verb Qana. <clears throat> At the beginning of his ways. <clears throat> Before his deeds of old, from everlasting I was installed. From the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. <clears throat> When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs heavy with water. <clears throat> before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields outside, now the first dust of the world, nor the first dust of the world, meaning I was there before creation. Watch. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he marked out a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became strong, when he set for the boundary its see when he set for the sea its boundary. This is Genesis 1, by the way. An allusion to Genesis 1. <clears throat> so that the water <clears throat> sorry guys, this is me, old and decaying, so that the water would not pass over his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him as a master workman. There you go. You guys got it? I was there alongside of him, creating, <clears throat> fashioning, and I was a daily delight, rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in the world, his earth, my delight is in the sons of men. Now watch the point. <clears throat> so now, O oh sons, listen to me. For blessed are they who keep my ways. <clears throat> Hear discipline and be wise and do not neglect it. How blessed is the man who hears me to watch daily at my doors, to keep watch at my doorpost. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from Yahweh. But he who sins against me does violence to his own soul. All those who hate me love death. Now, do you want to know what the point of all this is? 
Do you understand now what the point of this is? Can I break it down so that you don't get bogged down into trying to prove, well, no, Jesus isn't a creature and because that's not the point of Proverbs 8? The point of Proverbs 8 is this. <clears throat> if God himself always existed with wisdom, if God himself <clears throat> had wisdom by his side from before creation, if God himself used wisdom to create, and God himself does nothing <clears throat> without wisdom, how much more you, O foolish creature, imperfect, finite, temporal maggot, how much more should you do nothing without God's wisdom? If wisdom is that important to God, <clears throat> where God never did anything apart from wisdom, God always had wisdom, and God always used wisdom. If God would do nothing without wisdom, how much more should you do nothing without that wisdom that's with God? You get it now? That's the point. That's the point of the personification. And to prove to you that God does nothing without wisdom, we're going to go to Psalm 104, 24, but we're going to read the verses before it. <clears throat> Psalm 104, 24. It's all about creation, right? You see how long it is? It's very long. So read Psalm 104, right? He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, <clears throat> right? He founded the earth upon its place, right? It's talking about creation. Too much to read. He sends forth springs in the valleys. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle, vegetation, trees of Yahweh, cedars of Lebanon. Stork's home is in fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. It's talking about creation, right? How numerous are your works, O Yahweh? In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Psalm 104, 24. See that? In wisdom, you have made them all. You see, you see the point now? So were the early Christians wrong in thinking this was Christ? No. So the first question is, in its cultural historical background, is wisdom a divine being that speaks? No. It's God's attribute. His own uncreated eternal attribute that's being personified so that you can be taught the important lesson. Do nothing without God's wisdom. And God has been pleased to make his wisdom known to you. The very wisdom that he's always possessed, he's always had. And that he's always used to do everything. That's the wisdom he now gives you. So then, how does it apply to Christ? Well, let me show you now. You see why I got to do two parts, if you're okay with it? If you're okay with me doing two parts? The reason why the early Christians saw a picture of Christ is because the Bible tells us that wisdom of God is now found in Christ. Do you want to know what God's wisdom is? To live a life pleasing in His sight? You need Christ. Because Christ embodies. Christ reveals. Christ makes known God's perfect, infinite wisdom. Because wisdom is found in Him and no other. Okay? So then they saw a connection between what is said of wisdom and what is said of Christ. Okay, let me show you now. You ready? Here you go. <clears throat> Colossians 2, 2 to 3. So that their hearts may be encouraged, having been held together in love, even unto all the wealth of the full assurance of understanding, unto the full knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You caught it? Where do you find this wisdom of God in all its fullness and perfection? In Christ, because he makes that wisdom known 
because he possesses the infinite riches of wisdom and understanding. See it? Everyone got it, right? Before I move on? All right, what else? 1 Corinthians 1, 23, 24. Where do you find God's wisdom for salvation, for righteousness, for holiness, for purity, for glorification, for immortality? Here's where you find it. But we preach Christ crucified, 1 Corinthians 1, 23 to 24. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's where you see God's power perfectly revealed and displayed and God's perfect wisdom. In Christ, through Christ, by Christ. That's why Paul goes on to say right here. See what the point is? But by his doing, God's doing, you are in Christ. You are united to Christ. You believe in Christ. You're one spirit with him. And Christ has now become to us wisdom from God. He's the one who makes us wise and gives us wisdom. He's the one who makes us righteous and justifies us. He's the one who sets us apart and redeems us. See it? So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Is it all making sense now? Why the early Christians saw in Proverbs 8 a picture of Christ, even though in its historical, cultural context, it's not about Christ? That doesn't mean it can't be applied to Christ because the New Testament takes the language of wisdom and applies it to Christ. Here's one that should blow you away. Here's one. This one should blow you away. You ready? You ready to be blown away by this? All right. <clears throat> For this reason also, the wisdom of God said, here again, wisdom speaks. Here you have wisdom speaking again. Notice, be careful of translations like NIV. God and his wisdom said, no, that's not what it says. Literally it says, the wisdom of God said, it's wisdom speaking. And what does wisdom say? Watch. Wisdom says, I will send to them prophets and apostles. Some of them they will kill and some they will persecute. Okay. Wisdom is speaking. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says that wisdom said, I, wisdom, will send prophets and apostles. And when I do, they will end up killing some and persecuting others. Okay, you caught it? Let's see if you caught it because we're going to go out with a bang. We'll have more in part two of this. Do you got it? We're going to go out with a bang. God's wisdom is speaking. Jesus is saying, let me tell you what wisdom said. Here's what wisdom said. Wisdom said, I'm going to send you prophets, apostles. Some you'll kill, some you'll persecute. Right? Okay, now watch. Let's see if you catch the parallel. Wisdom says, I will send them prophets and apostles. Some they'll kill and persecute. Now watch Jesus in Matthew 23, 34. This is Jesus speaking. On account of this, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. I, Jesus, am going to send you prophets, wise scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Did you catch what our Lord did? Earlier, he said, Wisdom said that wisdom will send prophets and apostles. Some they'll kill, persecute. Later he says, I am the one to send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, whom you will kill, crucify, flog, or persecute. You caught it? Jesus speaking, on account of this, behold, I, Jesus, send you. By the way, only God sends prophets. Only God in heaven sends prophets on earth, 
apostles, wise men. Jesus says, in heaven, while I'm in heaven, I'll be the one sending you the prophets and wise men scribes. But this is what you're going to do to them. Some you're going to kill. Some you're going to crucify. Some you'll flog and persecute. But earlier in his ministry, he said, that's wisdom. In other words, if you take Luke 11, 49 and Matthew 23, 34 together, together, Jesus is identifying himself as the wisdom of God. I am God's wisdom who speaks. I am God's wisdom who became flesh. I am God's wisdom in all its fullness. You got it? So the early Christians were right. They were not wrong. They were right. Let me give you one final example of wisdom and Jesus. Now let's go to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, 21 to 30. Watch the language of wisdom, how it is applied to Christ. All right, chapter 7. I want you to see something interesting. Chapter 7, we're going to read from 21 to 30 because it's about wisdom again. And in Greek, Sophia, feminine noun, so she'll be spoken of as a woman. And all such things are as are either secret or manifest, them I know. For wisdom, watch here, which is the worker of all things, taught me. For in her is an understanding, spirit, holy. Now notice the inseparable operations. Wisdom and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. Wisdom works with the Spirit. The Spirit works with wisdom because they're inseparable, just like Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But I want you to catch this word, one and only. Let me show you what that word is, one and only. Okay? Let me show you what that word is. Okay? One and only, right? One only. Watch here. Mono. Genis, mono genis. This word is used of the Lord Jesus Christ five times by John in the Gospel of John and First John. Like Jesus, wisdom is mono genis. That's the word from which we get only begotten. Only begotten. All right, monogenes, used of wisdom, but used of Christ by John five times. Let's let me show you where. All right, okay, and then I'm going to show you the Greek. That's one connection. All right, John 1 14. Here it is, and I'm going to show you the Greek of it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Monogenus. I'm going to show you the Greek in a minute. John 1 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God. Monogenes Theos. John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Ton Mono. Guinea. Okay. John 3 6. John 3 18. He who believes in him is not judged, and he who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten. Mono Guinea. Mono Guinea. Mono Ganus. All from Mono Guinea. Son of God. Finally, 1 John 4 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son again the word is monogenes use of wisdom use of our lord now let me show you the greek in case you don't see it here it is is it monogenes let's see john 1 18 there it is monogenes same word see it same word See it? Mono guineas. Use of our Lord five times. John 1 18, right? Where is it? Let's go right here. Mono guineas. 
Use over a word for John 1 14, John 1 18, John 3 16, John 3 18. You see it? For John 4 9. The other connection with wisdom. The other connection with wisdom. Let me just show you here. Let me line it up first. Let me get this here. Let me line it up. Let me go here. All right, now watch here. The other connection, you ready? You guys asleep yet? You guys enjoying this? Let's keep reading. For wisdom, which is the worker of all things. Now notice, wisdom is, is de described as God, having all the attributes of God, almighty, all-knowing, all-pure, impeccable, infallible, right? Sinless, incorruptible, immortal, all-wise. For wisdom, which is the work of all things, taught me, for in her is an understanding, spirit holy, one only, manifold. She does many things, subtle. You don't sense her coming. She comes unaware, lively, clear, undefiled, plain, not subject to her, loving the thing that is good, quick, which cannot be let it, ready to do good, kind to man, steadfast, sure, free from care. Wisdom has no worries. Having all power, see, almighty. Overseeing all things, omniscient, going through all understanding, pure, and more most subtle spirits. So she possesses and fills pure men and women, not the wicked. Okay, watch here. For wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passeth and goeth through all things by reason of purity. She penetrates all creation. She fills all creation. So there's how many present? For she is the breath. Of the power of God. Because when God speaks, no, let me explain what this analogy is and the connection with God, wisdom, and spirit. Watch here. Put your hand by your mouth. Notice when you speak, you are breathing. So when it says she's a breath, because God speaks wisdom, wisdom comes out of the mouth of God. So when God wants you to know wisdom, he speaks forth wisdom. But as he speaks, when you speak words, when I give you instruction wisdom, notice I'm breathing when I form words. Now, this is a metaphor because God is not a physical being. But it's trying to show you that when wisdom comes forth, so does the spirit. Wisdom and the spirit work together, come forth together. Where wisdom is, the spirit will be. And where spirit is, wisdom will be. What we call perichoresis, right? So when Jesus shows up, the Spirit shows up. When the Spirit shows up, He reveals Jesus, makes Jesus known, and connects you to Christ. Are you seeing the imagery? You seeing the imagery, right? And I'll show it to you in Wisdom nine seventeen. God's wisdom and Holy Spirit work together because. Jesus being wisdom personified, always work with the Spirit, and they're inseparable here. Wisdom 917, here. So you don't think I'm making it up. And thy counsel, who hath known, wisdom 917. And thy counsel, who hath known, who can know your counsel except thou give wisdom and send thy Holy Spirit from above? You see, the Spirit brings forth wisdom. Wisdom comes forth with the Spirit. Where the Spirit is, there is wisdom, because wisdom and Spirit work together inseparably. Wisdom 9, 17. So let me make the other connection with Christ. Breath of the power of God and a pure influence flowing from the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, can no defiled thing fall into her. Now watch here, this key word. This here is going to blow you away. For she is... The brightness of the everlasting light. This word here appears only once in the Greek Deuterocanonicals. What's the word? Apokosma. See it right here? Get ready to be blown away. Apokosma. Apokosma. Watch that word, folks. Tell me if it looks similar. So I'm going to show you something. Hebrews 1.3. Speaking of Jesus, Hebrews 1, 3. What is Jesus? 
who being apokasma. Jesus is the radiance, the brightness of God's glory. There it is. This word is only used once in the New Testament and only once in the Deuterocanonicals. And it's used of Jesus in Hebrews 1.3 and of wisdom and wisdom of Solomon 7.26. You're telling me the New Testament doesn't know the Deuterocanonicals or doesn't cite the Deuterocanonicals? It's right there. Jesus is the apodosma, the radiance of God's glory. There's the same word, Hebrews 1.3. And the character, the exact imprint, representation, tis hupostasius autu, of his being, his substance. See, guys? So you see why the early Christians were right in seeing in Proverbs 8 and Proverbs 3 and Proverbs 1 and Wisdom 7 and Wisdom 9 and Sirach 20. Pictures of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here it is, apogasma. And what's the word? Apogasma, wisdom like Jesus, is the brightness, radiance of everlasting light. Now, let me ask you a question. If God is everlasting light, if God is everlasting light, and wisdom, is the brightness of that light. So if God is uncreated light, that means his brightness has always existed. It's uncreated too, right? You cannot have light without brightness. And if God is uncreated light, that means brightness is uncreated, which means wisdom is uncreated. But Jesus is said to be the apogasma of God's glory, which means Christ must be uncreated. You see how it works? So let's wrap it up, and the Lord will I'll try to be back later. The unspotted mirror of the power of God. Now, here's another connection with our Lord. Wisdom is the image of his goodness. Well, guess what the word image is? Icon. Icon. Que icon tis agathotitus autu. Icon. That's where you get the word icon image and what is jesus the icon of god the invisible god here in case you don't believe me do you understand why the early christians saw jesus in these texts do you understand here os estin icon jesus is the image to Theu, who is invisible, to Aoratu, Aoratu, Prototokos, Pasis, Ktisios. This is where I'm going to bury Greg Stafford and his fake God later. This is what they used to show that Christ is the first creature. So, like wisdom, Jesus is the icon, the image of God, the invisible God. He mirrors God, images God visibly. Like Jesus, wisdom, and like wisdom, Jesus is the apogasma, the uncreated brightness of uncreated light of God's glory. Here's another place where Jesus said to be the icon of the Father, icon of God. Ready? Here it is again, Christ. What, what is Christ? Here you go. To Christu of the Christ, os esteen. Icon to Theu, Christ, who is the icon, icon of the God. So much for God not condoning icons and images. If he didn't like icons and images, why then did Jesus become flesh to become the physical, visible icon of God? So you see what is said of wisdom is applied to Jesus, right? Even the unique words, apokasma, monogeni, monogenis, right? Applied to Jesus. Now let's continue to read about wisdom. And being but one, 
She can do all things. Remaining in herself, she maketh all things new. She renews you, just like in Christ, you're a new creation. And all ages entering into holy souls, like Christ indwells us. When we believe in him and are united to him by the Spirit. She maketh them friends of God. And that's what Jesus does in prophets. For God loveth none but him that dwelleth with wisdom. For she is more beautiful than the sun and above all the order of stars. Being compared with the light, she is found before it. She is more radiant, more glorious, and greater than light. For after this cometh night, but vice shall not prevail against wisdom. Right? So did we learn why? Exactly. Confirmation. Why the fathers, the church writers, saw Christ in these passages? So let me repeat. Historically, culturally, Proverbs 8 is about God's attribute, wisdom. It's personification. Since the Hebrew word for wisdom, the Greek word for wisdom is feminine, wisdom is being personified, described as a female to match the gender of the noun. But wisdom is not a woman. This is God's attribute. But it does point to Christ because what is said of wisdom is applied to Christ because Christ truly possesses, embodies the infinite riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God and he is the source of God's wisdom the reveal of God's wisdom so if you want to know God's wisdom you go to Christ because he's God in the flesh then in part two I'm going to show you that Proverbs 8 22 does not teach wisdom was created from nothing wisdom is uncreated always exists with God and came forth from God which is why the early Christians saw in Proverbs 8, 22, the eternal begetting of the Son, begotten, not made. Glory to the triune God.